So kia ora koutou everyone, uh, welcome to this, um, one of the uh, Talian's Leading Minds webinar series in conjunction with the last, uh, Veracity um, Lab. Uh, today we have uh, four speakers and uh, we have Jamie Cochran, for partner from Stace Hammond. Uh, we have Binu Paul, for, who's a, a specialist lead in FinTech at Financial Markets Authority and uh, Associate Professor David Ears from the University of Otago, um, Computer Science, and Associate um, Professor Alex Sims from the Department of Commercial Law at the University of Auckland. And as I said before, my name's Wayne Rumbles, lead um, of the New Zealand Law Foundation's project, uh, Technology and Legal Education. So I won't, I won't talk too much because we've got a lot to get through and um, I think it's gonna be very interesting and generate a lot of questions. Um, can I just ask that, for questions, can you put them in the chat, and I'll I'll go through those. Um, I may not be able to. We may not be able to address everybody's question, but we will um, we'll try and do that as much as possible, and possibly even address those afterwards. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Tation, and a pleasure to speak to you all uh, today on my favourite topic of uh, funny internet money. Uh, I'm, a, for, you, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a dispute resolution partner at, uh, in the Auckland office of Stace Hammond. Um, I specialise in financial civil services. Um, specifically, I call myself an insolvency and insurance um, specialist. I uh, am uh, low key obsessed with uh, oh, cryptocurrency. Yeah. And uh, that's increasingly becoming a big part of my practice. Yeah. Uh, today, I'm, I'm going to um, give you a, an overview of uh, NFTs and, and the legal issues uh, relating to those. I've prepared some slides. Uh, the slides are quite detailed. Um, I don't expect... Um, uh, I'm just going, really going to talk to them. Uh, they're, they're going to be made available for you so you can go back and review them. Uh, there's also additional uh, information on our Stace Hammond website, uh, including other uh, articles that we've um, we've put together to try and understand this topic, uh, because it is uh, it can be confusing for people who aren't familiar with it, who aren't um, I guess tech focused, and uh, um, I, I really see it uh, as a um, almost an obligation for lawyers to help uh, educate and, um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about the topic, so I'm more than happy to chew anyone's ear off about it. But um, uh, for my fellow panellists, please feel free to, to jump in uh, if you have any colour to add to the slides. Um, just in terms of uh, my background, how I came to crypto, I'm conscious I've only got 10 minutes, but I, um, I commenced my uh, law career at uh, a, a big firm named Kensington Swan around the time of the global financial crisis and um, worked um, uh, in the very busy insolvency team there. And uh, I guess uh, insolvency has been a, um, a focus for me or an interest for me in terms of the crypto space. I wanted to be able to advise my clients uh, the insolvency practitioners, if they did, um, if they were appointed on a uh, crypto-related insolvency, and uh, we'll, I'll talk about it very briefly shortly. But there are a couple of big um, uh, crypto insolvencies in relation to New Zealand, which are uh, Bitcoinica and um, Cryptopia. Um, I, um, yeah, in in, in terms of. Uh, why lawyers should care about crypto. I guess we are seeing um, more and more crypto-related instructions across a, a broad variety of, for a broad variety of clients, not just insolvency practitioners, but, um, you know, private wealth, people who own crypto, who are concerned about tax issues, people who are involved in crypto-related businesses wanting to um, uh, perhaps... Uh, uh, mint NFTs because they are a, a tech or marketing business or if they are artists who want to um, use uh, crypto and NFTs as a new digital medium. Um, 
parties uh, involved in, in, in game fi who are interested in um, a whole range of crypto related matters i guess the way that i view crypto is that it is um well they're digital assets and um digital assets and particularly particular money touch many areas of law and as crypto is increasingly adopted increasingly uh, uh, uh approaches mainstream the more uh, legal issues that i believe will arise uh, particularly as everyone is on an educational journey and uh, at the moment you know there's no specific crypto law what we're looking at is how is the existing law going to be applied to crypto okay so i guess we um from a very a broad um perspective i i think about uh, blockchains uh, a bit like a database rather than being a centralized database which is held by um, you know, one one particular company or uh, entity, they are. Uh, it's a database um, spread across a whole network of computers. It's decentralized. So, in, um, on the topic of NFTs, there's a, a distinction between fungible and non fungible. Fungible is uh, something that's interchangeable, like cash. Cash is your 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 classic example of something fungible. NFTs, on the other hand, are non-fungible. Rather, they are um, unique digital assets. They all, all tend to be um, a, a bit different. All right. So what I've said here is they can be artworks, collectibles, entertainment, identity verification, tickets. It's not just NFTs are not just JPEG profile pictures, while they can be, uh, and they and they're not just uh, fine art. They are. Uh, they have a whole range of uses, and as I've said, there they're a way for creators and brands to connect with their customers, fans, and communities. And there's just enormous uh, opportunity to to use them uh, in business. So what I've said here is a a, a Pandora's box for estates and beneficiaries uh, for those creators who've got a cachet of uh, artwork or you know, music, uh, video, um, uh, any other type of uh, original physical works, they can be digitized. So there's uh, a lot of opportunity. Some NFTs are being paired with um, with physical works or original works. For example, Damien Hurst, uh, UK artist Damien Hurst, he's got the currency, which is this uh, collection of NFTs. And some of those are original, and um, and some are just the NFTs. That and it's up to the uh, owner what they do. They can decide to uh, to burn the NFT if they want, and that might, in theory, make the uh, original uh, artwork more rare and therefore more valuable. But equally, um, they might pref prefer to destroy the original. What um, the reason why? The blockchain is important for NFTs and for art, uh, is because it, it provides a, a record uh, of the transaction in art terms. That is uh, what's called provenance. You're able to establish um, um, the authenticity of the the piece, and that's all done by way of timestamp. The blockchain itself is all open and transparent, so anyone can can access it. Um, but at the same time, it's anonymized, so you don't necessarily know who owns the assets. So um, if we just, Richmond, just go back to the previous slide. Um, what I've said, there's uh, the uh, next slide, please, the, the, the one by your competitor. Um, so, for example, the NFTs can be a one of uh, one, of one uh, such uh, as this example by uh, York Better Magele Suomasi. Um, and um, we've been working with Yoka and a team from Creative NZ, who's looking to help uh, a, a group of uh, Pacific art artists to uh, explore NFTs and, and make NFT related artwork. But that's just one, uh, one type. If we go to the next one, 
the um, otherwise NFTs can be part of a collection. Uh, the way I think of it is more like baseball collector cards or comic books. But um, in most cases, the, the NFTs are going to be unique in some way. So in this case, the, the pictures of a New Zealand NFT project by non-fungible labs called Fluff World. They are a collection of um, different rabbits. It's a, uh, I wasn't able to convince my wife to uh, invest uh, $6,000 in a digital rabbit. So I don't own one, but um, uh, I understand that they're a, a metaverse related um, NFT and we can uh, come to that. But each one is unique in their own way. They have different uh, rarities that can give them different values. And, um, but in essence, I guess the, the analogy that I make is they are like collector's items. Uh, next. This, um, this is a example of a, uh, another metaverse NFT that's actually a, uh, a, a my avatar for the portals NFT. Um, uh, with portals, you can, you can, by owning the NFT, that allows you to access the platform, which uh, is like a, um, allows you to design your own building or, or metaverse meeting room so you can conduct meetings and things like that. So this particular NFT has a lot of utility um, and it plays a bit like a game um, as a, I guess, uh, uh, someone who got mildly addicted to Counter-Strike when I was in my early days of uh, law school. Um, it's something that appeals to me. Um, next, next slide. Another uh, version of NFTs, which uh, really took off uh, last year, uh, is the play to earn a variety of NFTs. So these are, um, this is uh, uh, an example called Axie Infinity, where people could um, es essentially farm. Um, uh, it's like a farming type game where uh, people could use the NFTs to um, earn uh, cryptocurrency tokens. And um, it, in the Philippines, it was actually uh, widely adopted, I think it was the Philippines, widely adopted and, and um, there were reports that people were in fact earning more than the, you know, the average uh, minimum wage for that country for a period. Uh, next slide. So uh, one of the first issues, I guess, uh, which uh, was clarified in the, the um, insolvency of Cryptopia, the Rusko and Cryptopia case, was whether crypto is in fact property um, and in that case, it was found that it is the sort of property that could be the subject of a trust. Uh, there's another case that we're aware of called Beck and Wilkerson, which um, um, discussed whether or not Litecoin was a relationship property, and it proceeded on the basis that it was. Uh, it's unresolved in New Zealand at this point whether NFTs are uh, going to be recognised as property. Uh, there's been a, a case in the in the UK uh, about um, NFTs called Boss Beauties, and uh, in that case, the the UK court uh, said that they were uh, property, and that property could be subject of an injunction. Um, and in that case, they compelled the marketplace, which um, which was uh, selling these stolen NFTs, to provide information. Um, so um, one uh, issue which um, perhaps Danu can talk to a bit more, uh, and, um, and no doubt he will, is, uh, which is quite a key issue for my clients who are, uh, for example, um, creating NFT-related businesses, is whether or not the Financial Markets Conduct Act or the uh, Financial Services Providers Registration and Dispute Resolution Act uh, applies to the Mint and... Um, uh, I guess at the moment this is unclear whether or not the the NFTs which are, are, are being minted and sold are um, financial products or not. Um, there's certainly aspects where you know these things look like they could just be an ordinary sale of an artwork, for example, and so they shouldn't um, trigger uh, the, the the laws mentioned. Um, but 
at the moment there, I guess there's a, from my point of view, uh, there's a lack of clarity from our regulators as to um, exactly how the law is um, to apply to NFTs. Um, the case mentioned there, Freel and Dapper Labs, uh, in that case, it's a US case, is some disgruntled investors um, and NBA Top Shot are suing the um, creators of the project on the basis that they're, um, uh, for among other things, that the NFTs are, are unregistered securities and the proper disclosure um, wasn't complied with. Um, uh, next slide. Oh, sorry, um, James, you might have to uh, <coughs> tidy Speed up. it up. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, okay. Um, intellectual uh, property issues. There's a question over, um, I guess, the extent of uh, rights that are acquired uh, when someone purchases an NFT. Uh, and in part, this depends on uh, contractual terms, uh, the smart contract itself, but also the contractual terms of the marketplace. Um, next slide. Um, so this is an example of uh, how um, Yuga Labs, which has created one of the most uh, popular NFT collections, which is called um, Board Ape Yacht Club. Justin Bieber's got one. Jimmy Fallon's got one. Everyone's got one. They're worth heaps. Um, they they took a different approach to a di another major project called CryptoPunks, where they essentially granted uh, full commercial rights to all the holders of the NFTs. And um, so that was just a different approach. Uh, there's also mention of a case uh, involving um, the creator of, uh, well, EMAs, I think I pronounced that right, the uh, creator of the Birkin bag. Um, they uh, uh, brought an action against the creator of um, Meta Birkins for trademark infringement. Next. Um, misleading statements, I guess uh, the, the point about this is that there is potential liability under the Financial Markets Conduct Act and also under the Fair Trading Act in relation to uh, businesses and creatives uh, who uh, promote NFTs. Uh, tax is a big one. I guess a lot of people assume that um, NFTs, crypto is sort of outside the purview of um, um, the eye of uh, perhaps the tax man, um, but um, I, I think that's quite the opposite. And um, there are a lot of uh, issues to consider uh, for anyone who's uh, buying and, and selling these things or uh, and, and um, utilizing them for business. So I, I think we might need to hand over the, the noon now. Sorry, James. Yeah, sure. I've only got uh, two to go, but. Um, I'm happy to hand over. Hey, thanks, thanks, James. Uh, thanks, Wayne and Richmond for having me here. And Kira, good afternoon to all of you. Um, in the interest of time, I might just uh, use the next five minutes to quickly go through a couple of things that uh, James has touched on as well. Um, and most definitely, we can get into the specifics uh, as, as, as we progress. So uh, to, to James's point, uh, in New Zealand, if you think about the NZ Constitution, the way it's structured is, We've got the legislature, we've got the executive branch, and then we've got the judiciary. Uh, so the legislature is uh, the group of people who actually put laws in place and regulations in place, rather laws, laws and legislation in place. The executive branch is the one that administers it, and the judiciary is the one that actually interprets it and applies it to the real world. So in that sense, the Financial Markets Authority, who I work for, I'm the specialist lead fintech for the FMA, uh, what we do is administer a lot of the laws that do apply to the financial services market or the financial markets. Um, there's a handful that apply to the subject matter today with this uh, non-fungible tokens. So in New Zealand, as per legislation, we've, we've actually clearly got definition around what a financial service is, and there's a definition around what a financial product is. Uh, so there's, there's a list of probably around 20, 25 activities that if you undertake, you will be categorized as providing a financial service. Um, and then there's the four categories of products that will capture you within the definition of a financial product. Uh, each of these requires certain obligations for you to meet. Uh, and what that means is if you're providing one of those activities, then you will need to be registered on a government register. 
you'll need to sign up to an independent dispute resolution scheme and a couple of other obligations. On the other hand, if that looks like one of the features of those four categories of products, uh, then you will need to get a license to operate as well. The one useful takeaway I, I'll, I'll provide you, and I know there's a huge diversity of uh, people online who's joined in, so uh, forgive me if this is too basic, but uh, a lot of the legislation drafted is actually quite technology neutral. What I mean by that, uh, legislation typically tends to look through the technology. So forget the form of what the product is and looks through the economic substance. Uh, and what I mean by that is regardless of whether a product lives in the real world or if it's online, exclusively digital, uh, regardless, the same kind of loss apply. The question is, regardless of if you put aside the technology, whether it's blockchain or not, look through it and look at what the economic substance is. If the substance looks like one of those four items that I mentioned about financial products, then yes, it's going to be regulated. Uh, so that's that's broadly where we sit in terms from a regulatory perspective. Uh, the other points I wanted to touch on really were some very quick observations. Um, I've been closely, I, I probably call myself a bystander in the blockchain uh, space for the last nine years or so. So I've been kind of observing a whole heap of um, new trends uh, and, and the whole area evolving over that period of time. Uh, and I suppose there's really two major things that dri that's driving today's uh, high adoption rates. Um, and, and the first one is around our ability now to decentralize what has traditionally been a organized initiative. And that could be a company or it could be some kind of protocol doesn't really matter. Any organized initiative today, you can use blockchain technology and actually decentralize that activity. The second, what I call a mega trend is around the ability to actually create digital representations of, of assets. And what I mean by that is tokenization. And NFT is just one example of how you tokenize. The only thing I would say is tokenization in itself, um, it's been around for years. That is not new. So for example, uh, when you go to a theme park, uh, the wristband you get is actually a token. Uh, what it does, it provides you certain benefits in terms of your ability to go on certain rides uh, and make use of what's built into that. So that's actually a token. So tokenization in itself is not new, but the ability now to have decentralized structures with the tokenization and the, the proliferation of mobile devices in everybody's hands is just become very, very powerful. So I'll freely admit that um, I'm probably more fascinated by the potential use cases of this underlying technology more than a lot of the activities that uh, that you see today in terms of trading uh, or, or buying and selling of, of crypto assets. So there, there is a lot of legs, I think, in terms of potential use of this technology. There's always this argument around whether the technology is efficient or not, uh, and that's, that's a whole different kettle of fish. So I won't get into that now. Um, and from a consumer perspective, what I would say is it's super important uh, that people remember uh, to have a reason for why they're buying into some of these uh, type of crypto assets. So as James said, a vast majority today that I come across in terms of NFTs, it's around uh, either the gaming sector or it's around the collectibles sector. Uh, now I'm a stamp collector, it's in the real world. I've got around 3000 stamps. Um, they're not NFTs, they are real world stamps and I'm, it's so precious I keep them locked up in a bank vault. Um, it, it's a similar kind of concept. When I'm trying to exchange one of my stamps or when I'm looking to trade it with someone else, I have I, I put a value in my head as to how valuable that particular piece is. NFTs kind of operate in the same way. Um, there is no particular science or, or art in trying to, trying to value those NFTs. The value is going to sit in the eye of the beholder, so to say. So if you are a collector uh, and if you are pretty passionate about that particular NFT, then so be it. That's a good enough reason to own one. On the other hand, if you're looking to profit from one of those, I always say um, the way you make money is when you find someone who's willing to pay you more than what you paid for it. And that applies to most collectible items, including my stamps, right? And so the question is, uh, if your, your potential to profit from it, it depends on someone else's sentiment, that is okay, as long as you're happy to be in that space which is probably why you get a lot of messages in the media around don't bet your house on it or don't put in more money than you can lose uh, into these kind of uh, kind of new, new, new assets. Uh, so as I said, a vast majority of NFTs today 
are not categorized as financial products because they don't tick the box when it comes to uh, looking into what, what the characteristics are and what the economic substance is. Uh, the only, uh, the, the final message I want to say is if, if you still want to go uh, and, and get engaged with NFTs, uh, you may relatively be slightly better off engaging with exchanges that are domiciled in New Zealand. And I say that only because typically uh, they would be providing a financial service. And then, like I said, as a result, they'll need to be registered on FSPR, which is the financial service provider register, but they will also have a dispute resolution scheme. So there is some minimum level of recourse um, if you engage with NZ domiciled exchanges. Um, I'm going to finish now because I, I, I'd rather engage in the Q&A at the end. Um, so I'll, I'll finish up now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Benu. Um, so we'll hand over to David now. Thank you. Do you want me to share my own slide, or are you going to share that one? It sounds like I'm going to share it in the yeah, interest of so. time. So I'll just um, I wanted to kind of quickly go over some of the technical side of um, this picture. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, and also, I'm terrible at counter strike So Jamie, if you want an easy target, just just get in contact online. Um, I'm very interested in how I can see that lawyers now today need to provide advice on these sorts of issues. But I think a lot of the technology space here is pretty much about as much of a mess as it actually appears. This is a moving target. It's a developing area. It's, it's lots of interesting stuff is coming from that. My general feeling is the following. We will be moving towards decentralization, you know, completely agree. And I think that's really important and useful. There is going to be technological, social, economic shifts in that direction. I do not believe that it's necessarily the case that we're going to move from centralized systems completely to the open blockchain systems that we commonly see right now. And that's what I've tried to sketch on this kind of page here. NFT is a terrible, terrible, terrible term because it's a technology that's been turned into a term. That's not helpful. Really, it's just a digital data record that has an owner. That is essentially what an NFT is. You can store them in databases. But you know, your point about tokenization is well read. This stuff is not new. It's been around for ages. If you look down my left column, I've summarized that down the very bottom as being kind of known. And if you like, I'm not trying to offend anyone. It's sort of almost boring technology. We know how to do databases. We know how to do business rules. You guys know how to do contracts. I don't, but that's good that you do. We, in that case, you're trusting the owner of the database. We have safe, well-established algorithms to handle that. If you go completely to the extreme of the open blockchain, the permissionless blockchain world, you have to have a whole lot of really technically interesting but potentially risky alternatives here, you shift your trust base to the collection of all of the miners that are involved in whatever scheme you're using. You don't know them, um, so you have to be happy with the fact that that's the case, but they have a collective interest in keeping the blockchain alive at that particular point in time for whatever reason. They may be making money from crypto or whatever else. But we have the difficulty that how you form consensus is still you know, a developing area. Proof of work is absolutely terrible. It's going to set the planet on fire more than we're going to do anyway. But the thing is, there are alternatives emerging. Proof of stake is coming. But if you look at something like Ethereum, one of the very big uh, blockchains that has NFTs on it, they've been trying to transition away from proof of work for years, and they haven't successfully done so. So this is still a bit of a risk area. But my point is, there's a technology space in the middle. It's this gaping hole we haven't investigated yet. And that's the closed blockchain. Well, I mean, people have investigated it, but it's not where you get the largest amount of hype. And that's where you actually end up with fairly boring technology. You end up with business rules and conventional contracts, the ability to go through normal routes in your legal system for recourse to compensation and you know, dispute resolution. That stuff can be done using the normal existing legal system of the sovereign country you belong to, rather than trusting programmers you don't know to implement smart contracts. So in that world, we can still develop a case where you have decentralized trust. And I think this is just underexplored at the moment. Within New Zealand, I would love it to be the case that we could have a collection of organizations that were known and essentially broadly trusted that form a collective and can run one of these closed blockchain systems. You can still do NFTs, you can still have the decentralized control, but you get safe, well-established algorithms. You don't have the environmental problems of proof of work or the risks of proof of stake, and you're just generally in a better situation. But we're not there yet. So I fully acknowledge right now we're looking at a world where you know NFTs are probably going to be on open blockchains. They're a long distance away from our conventional systems. But I would just say, think about these things always ask do you really need to go there what's the alternative what's the risk that you're actually taking on and being involved in that space and i think i'll finish there because i'm sure there'll be plenty of q a thanks david uh Pleasure. 
can you just stop sharing your screen there. Sweet, thanks. Um, so over to you, Alex. <clears throat> Sorry, I was just on mute. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Wayne. So, um, so I'm just my timer. Um, okay, so just on um, NFTs, um, just to clarify um, a few things, is that yes, NFTs um, can be, um, they're often called, you know, one of a kind type of thing, but, no, it, it all depends. So it depends on the type of NFT. There's lots of different ones. So uh, you can have limited edition NFTs, and this is already happening. So say, for example, Nike, um, Nike, whatever, has released um, sneakers, which are NFTs. So you can, if you are in a metaverse, which is basically an online world, you'll be able to go around on your avatar and have your um, sneakers on. So no real different from the real world. I mean, there's pushback. People say, well, why, why on earth would I have something like that? Um, I want to wear my sneakers. Well, I can tell you a lot of people purchase um, sneakers like Nike um, ones, and they never wear them because you can only wear one pair at a time. So, you know, that, that's useful. So it's a bit like um, I think James was saying, you know, like baseball cards. Yeah, well, if you, if you did collect baseball cards, remember there's lots, there may be one very rarely but there's often ten thousand of a of a baseball card so you know it's still you know yes you own one of ten thousand type of thing but they're all the they're all the same um another um thing is that while they're non-fungible you can for some nfts they are created as fractionalized nft so it's called f nft so that is where you've got might be a their expensive painting, might be a piece of land, and there's 10,000 tokens. And so different people can own different tokens. So that's fine. Um, you can do that. Um, another um, quick thing, and this is the same with all of technology, is a lot mo at the moment people say, well, it's not very efficient and it's clumsy and we've got our centralized systems that work much better. But that is the same with all new technology. So everyone sort of forgets the early days of the internet. How long did it you had to wait to download a page? We couldn't watch, I mean, couldn't watch um, videos or anything like that. So it, it takes time. And this is the same thing with all of it. So yes, at the moment, it's, it's um, inefficient. Um, another sort of point is that um, when we're talking about original artworks, um, I think what James meant was a physical artwork. And so that's the thing with Damien Hirst. So there are, for some of them, some physical artworks. Because original, um, especially when we talk about NFTs, um, relates to copyright law. And this is actually another, another point, and also comes back to provenance, that um, you have to be careful because, yes, you could see that someone has created an NFT and when it was created, but that doesn't tell you whether that NFT is infringing copyright. Because... There's been a lot of infringement going on of people ripping off other people like memes and all sorts of things like that and artworks and creating an NFT based on that. And the law is, is that, you know, it, it's infringing. You don't get anything. Um, if you start to use it, you may well be sued by cop for copyright infringement by the actual owner. And now people say, well, this is outrageous that people can do this. But that's what happens in the real world. People copy other people's artwork and do all sorts of things and sell it. And so, um, and what's really interesting with blockchain generally is it doesn't remove trust, okay? So some people think that you don't need any middlemen or anything like that, but it just gives us more of a confidence so you can have confidence in something. So for example, if you did see um, an NFT of some um, artist or New Zealand creator that you liked, well, the first thing you do is contact them and say, look, did you actually mint this or was this minted or created, you know, under your license, your permission, because there's a lot of stuff that um, that goes on with that. And we all know um, the lawyers here that, you know, if um, well, another thing is that uh, they can be stolen as well. So if you go and buy an NFT of someone that is actually stolen, then too bad, Nemo Dat, you won't become the owner of it as well. So, so there is still a lot of um, buyer beware, but also, just with NFTs generally, there is so much focus on art, especially digital art. But as has already been alluded to, 
you can use NFTs for all sorts of things. Um, and even it might just be an access right. So say, for example, you are a um, performing artist in New Zealand, you're a singer or something, and you want your, your um, fans to be able to purchase tickets um, and not have to buy them off a scalper later on. You know, if you're a one-owned band, the tickets sell out in a few minutes. But what you can do, for example, is give NFTs to each of your true fans and that can be used for when the tickets do come, whoever's got that NFT gets first dibs to buy it. And you can make them non-transferable. So that's another thing that some of these aren't um, transferable. Um, there's also, you know, things like, I think, think about identity um, documents, but also things like um, qualifications. So tertiary qualifications, other things that will be, or well, already people are doing them essentially as NFTs. And so they won't be transferable because they'll be tied to someone's digital identity. So it, it's, you know, there's a sort of a, just a focus too much on the digital um, artwork. Uh, the other quick thing about, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that says that if you do have, say, digital artworks, that they are all minted on Ethereum. Well, quite a few of them are but there's lots of other Tezos, um, a whole lot of other um, platforms which you can mint um, NFTs on. And for some of them, like Tezos, the carbon footprint is the same as writing a tweet. So, you know, just because blockchain is being used does not mean to say it is destroying the environment. But unfortunately, that message doesn't get through. And I saw, I think it was World Wildlife Fund a while ago, they were criticised for using NFTs and withdrew the whole thing. Which what you know it's it's just very simplistic um, and there's a lot well, of. It's not um, wrong if they're using the wrong NFTs. You've got to use the right NFTs in the yeah, right okay, places. Okay, okay, that's simple. No. Okay, but what I what I'm saying is that some people say that you can't use NFTs at all. So um, yeah, that's wrong. But you've got to get the right ones, and if they can't get the right ones, then they yeah, can't yeah. use them. Okay. Um, another quick thing with it is is that again it depends on the NFT, but most of if you've got digital artwork most of the NFTs will not be, um, the digital file is not going to be recorded on the blockchain. That will be sitting somewhere else. And that raises issues because some of these ones, they are centralized systems like OpenSea and other ones. And, you know, <laughs> they're meant to be sort of um, keeping this and they may not. So yeah, just because it's NFT does not mean to say it's um, decentralized. And it, also another quick thing for people that haven't sort of, engaged all that much yet with um, blockchain and decentralization and things. Um, a good way of thinking about all this, it's because um, you've also got, you've got your centralized, you've got your public permissionless blockchains, but like Bitcoin and Ethereum, then you've got your permissioned ones, which David was talking about. Well, the way I see it um, is that permissioned ones are very much like the early days of the internet. Okay. So you had America Online and CompuServe, which was all a walled garden. So within there, it was all nice and safe and you could control it. But the actual practical utility was pretty limited. And it wasn't until they realized, well, this isn't really going to work. Took it down. We have the open internet. And yes, it's caused a few problems, but that's where you get the power. So, so yeah, the permission ones are fine, but they've got... Um, uh, very, very limited utility, and also I no, think no, no. the analogy with goods. Apple, with the Apple Store, the Apple Store is a permissioned environment. So is Netflix. Those are permissioned environments that work just fine. Yes, and what I'm saying is that's fine. So people can make a choice about what they're what they're dealing with. Okay, I'll stop there. Yeah, but so like I said, the evolution. There's going to be there's a lot of pressure towards centralization. And the question is, is that going to affect these blockchains in the same way? So like taking, Alex, what you were saying about the birth of the internet, you can kind of see how that comes together then in these really big players now taking over control. That's centralized too much. I think we need to decentralize from that. I would agree. But we don't have to go completely into the open um, blockchain space. Today. No, no, we, sorry. We do, we do, yes. Um, but now we've got a thing with, very quickly, we've got a... Um, We've had web one, we're in web two and web three. So web one was read only, web two is read write. And now we've got the read write and own. And now when you're setting up, especially an online organization, you've got two things you can do. You can have a centralized, you know, Facebook and Google, or you have a decentralized autonomous organization, which actually allows people to um, 
to not only own, but also govern. So that is a very, very, very interesting thing. And yes, we've got to be careful that it doesn't become decentralized. I'm um, sorry, centralized, but we do have the tools now to do this. Okay. So Alex, did you hit, did you have some other points you wanted to cover? Um, no, no, I've spoken for 10 minutes, so that's fine. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Um, so we're open for questions now. Um, you can either um, speak your question or you can um, just put in uh, in the chat there. Yeah. So we've got one from Barry. Um, says he's struggling with NFTs being securities. Um, oops, it's just. Sorry. Well, that's the thing is that, sorry, with this is that, yeah, if it's technologically neutral, they should not be treated as security, surely. Because, because also with NFTs, I know James is interested in this as well. If you've got an artist who is creating a painting and selling that painting, and then you try and say, well, if you're an artist that creates a digital artwork as an NFT, that you're going to be subject to, you know, um, license, having to license under FMA. For me, that doesn't make sense because to, to, the, if you do a technologically neutral frame, they are, you know, the same as the analog situation. Uh, okay, we've got Nicholas is asking um, the uh, FATF guidance recognizes difference between d definitions of digital assets versus virtual assets. Um, when do NFTs lose their characteristics as virtual assets and cross over to become digital? Uh, I think so. I think virtual and digital, they, they're often used interchangeably. So that's the trouble we've got in this area. There is no consistent technology because we even call cryptocurrency exchanges VASPs, virtual asset providers, when in fact now they'd be called something different. Okay. Um, Barry, can I say something here? Yes. On, on, on that, um, there's uh, uh, related to, to that issue about virtual and digital and whether they become assets or not, um, that, and, and some NFTs are being offered as digital in that you uh, obtain a uh, when you buy the artwork say uh, you obtain the physical work as well as an nft uh, that uh, describes it so so that's that's a that's part of the changing uh, environment yeah that's the um damien hurst example and also the charles goldie uh, example yeah so in the in the goldie example they, they had plates that could actually um, which were uh, used for the negatives, the plates could actually be smashed, which would, in theory, make the NFT more valuable. Okay, we've got a question from Barry. Um, he would like to hear um, what arguments for um, NFTs being securities. Anyone got an argument for NFTs being securities? That's a question for, for Benu, isn't it? Um, I think I think uh, I go back to what I earlier said. Um, if the feature of the NFT looks like it's one of the four categories of a financial product, uh, it has got a lot. Uh, it, it is it is regulated today, um, but for a vast majority of NFTs I've come across, I haven't seen anything that resembles a financial security. So I'm I'm not for it. Uh, I'm I'm not supporting it. So I, hence why I didn't have a comment. Uh, but should an NFT be structured in the way that it has the properties of a financial product? Currently, the regulation exists to, to address that. Um, we've got a question from Nicholas. Oh, it's just zoomed up. There. We've got a lot of questions coming in. We're not, we're not going to be able to cover them all. But um, maybe, Alex, you might be able to answer this. What type of legal entity can you use to form a DAO? Uh, well, um if you form a DAO um, in New Zealand, um, well, it depends. I mean, it depends whether it's for profit or not for profit. So if it's for profit, then it's going to be a general partnership, probably. And if it's not for profit, it'll be an unincorporated association, or unincorporated society. So it really does depend. Um, there is legislation overseas. Um, in Australia, they're thinking of changing the Corporations Act. They want to. Um, to cover uh, DAOs, but that's not going to cover all of them. Um, I have written a PhD on this, so um, if you want more, just Google that and have a, 
have a look see. Um, it's just it's just fascinating from from it. But just to, I mean, well, I won't go on forever. But it it all comes down to people. And so some people think we've got this really cool technology, we can do what we want, but no, you've got people involved. So it's not, um, and it's it's very, very complicated. I'm working with you know, a team at the moment. And so, and one of the person said, oh, let's set up a DAO to do this, you know, to run our project. And I'm going, oh, you know, do we really want to do this? It's a lot of, it's just, uh, I mean, they've got real uses, they can be used, they are being used. But I think a lot of people sort of run away with them. And, and also things are being called DAOs when they are not DAOs at all. So you've just got to be really careful with them. Thanks, Alex. I guess um, just, and if I, if I might, Wayne, just yep. bringing it back to NFTs, I guess there is a, a DAO element for some NFT projects. Um, one, in getting back to the question about um, whether... NFTs are financial products or securities. I guess there is this ability for the FMA to deem um, something that uh, fits within the definition of security, a security and treat it as a financial product. And the, the definition of security is quite broad. And um, that's where I see there's a need for uh, guidance from uh, the regulator, a bit more clarity about uh, how the, the um, the act might apply to NFTs uh, just to, because you have this situation where people can be largely anonymous online uh, or they can, um, you know, we have a lot of projects who want to, to do things in a compliant way. They want to, um, for instance, be out uh, in the open. Um, they don't want to be using a, a pseudonym. Uh, they don't want to be hiding in the shadows, but uh, if there is this risk that they they do a project and um, potentially they they uh, face some serious liability, that um, if there's a lack of clarity, but the cost of obtaining advice is um, expensive, if the cost of going to the regulator is expensive, that can be a, a, a disincentive, and um, that can push people towards the shadows. When I think you know. In New Zealand, I think we want to build a thriving gig economy, and um, that's where I think there's a real opportunity. If we do have more guidance and clarity, that we can really, um, uh, you know, um, encourage the businesses which employ people who pay the, you know, pay their employees and uh, cryptocurrencies, and uh, you know, um, there's a real opportunity here. And I wouldn't want that to be lost just because there's a lack of clarity, if that makes sense. Just on that, uh, for the benefit of people who are listening in, um, if you go to the website fintech.govt.nz, uh, it's an initiative that the Council of Financial Regulators in New Zealand uh, launched last year. So essentially how it works is a regulatory guidance service and people who apply for it uh, get a one-hour meeting with five or six government agencies all at the same time. So this includes the FMA, the Reserve Bank, or the Commerce Commission, Treasury, and the MBIE. And in a lot of meetings, the Department of Internal Affairs sits in as well because they've got an anti-money laundering uh, hat on as well. So since launch in May, um, so, I, so I chair the Digital and Innovation Working Group of the Council. And then May we launched last year. And as of Friday last week, they've had around 62 FinTech startups come through to use that service. Rough and ready, around 30 to 35 percent of them have been in the uh, digital asset space or the crypto area. Um, out of that, there's been at least three companies that are or startups looking at launching NFTs. Uh, so they've used the service, they've come through it. Uh, a lot of times, it didn't fall within our remit. There was one which fell within our remit. Uh, almost invariably, all of them fell within the financial services regime, though, although they didn't fall under the financial product regime. So for anyone who's interested in getting into that area, definitely go onto the website and make use of it. If you're looking on a, working on a new project, uh, more than welcome. Uh, just wanted to mention that. Thanks. Thanks, Benu. Uh, there's, there's a couple of related questions. So I'll sort of ask them as one question here. Um, why would anyone want to mint a NFT of a physical object? And what would happen if the physical and digital NFT were separated? So the plate's not smashed. So maybe it was gifted or transferred um, in terms of the physical object and while the digital um, NFT would be retained. Uh, 
Um, well, the it depends what what it is um, because you could have a a, a um, an NFT which is a replica of the physical artwork. So it's like a. I think that happened with the Goldie one, did it, James? Uh, I think the, the the Goldie one is basically a a, a representation of the image. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it's but but. Um, it, Often, what will happen increasingly is that they will be a just like a, a like almost like a certificate of ownership for it. So it won't be the actual no, you know the physical works there, and this is just a certificate, which is actually really 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 useful because we don't have that at the moment, and there's lots of issues with that in our system. Because how do you prove that you own something? I always do this with students. I say, how do you prove you know whatever? And they go, oh, oh. I mean, like your phone. Well, what do you do? receipts maybe you know there's no register for personal property so this is one way sort of of, of helping it um the bit about smashing or something again it just, just depends on the fact it's really hard but if they are linked together um and that's sort of proving the ownership then um who if they're separated and someone else gets it well then whoever is showing up as the owner and the on the nft would be the owner I presume. yeah I th from my point of view i see it um it's quite conceivable that the different forms of the art can go different ways and have different owners. Uh, it just depends on the what happens with them. Really depends on the the terms of uh, sale, right? In terms of uh, the NFT sale and also the physical item sale. Yeah. So with all the law, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's there's a question here. Um, how do you? Uh, uh, it's not a, it's not a silly question, Emily. Um, is how do you prove ownership um, of an NFT? Um, I, I guess what you would uh, well you can most uh, NFTs you can look at them on the blockchain and they have a timestamp. So if if you believe you there are two of um, that look the same. Um, uh, you you should be able to to check, I guess, with the exchange. Often the exchange has a, a verified artist um, function that um, confirms that it's from a particular collection by a particular artist. Uh, but also, let, let's say you had two that looked the same, um, you would look to the one that was perhaps minted earlier in time according to timestamp. But also it depends because you may have the artist who, and this has happened, who has um, made um, four different NFTs that are almost identical? They've just changed them slightly, um, and but that then comes down to um, they're all and they're all you know they all look the same, but they're all so-called different NFTs. But if you, if the artist has sort of represented that you're buying one of one, and it turns out that it's not, then again you know that's where it comes down to trusting the artist and that they haven't ripped you off. And, um, and that, again, that's no different to the to normal law where you can, you know, some artists can just keep on making a whole lot of copies of their work. So, again, it's buyer, you know, buyer beware. It doesn't, a lot of this doesn't change anything, you know. Um, it's not suddenly the new, brand new things. It's just the existing practices and law, which is what Bina was saying before, really. So we've got... Uh... <clears throat> Uh, just before we wrap up, there's one last last question here, um, uh, referring to the uh, Goldie um, originals and um, describing the uh, copies of them by a, 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 a fraudster who got around it by changing its name to Goldie and asking, could this happen with NFTs, where someone was faking um, the identity? Yeah, it's quite conceivable that uh, someone could Im impersonate a, a, a real artist. Um, I think in New Zealand, we've got a platform called Glorious. They are, um, this is the one that Dan Carter and uh, Michael Heron QC are um, part of. I think they are, um, are making a conscious effort to um, have a, a platform which is trusted and that they do have um, uh, certain agreements with the uh, artists or their estates so that the buying public can, can feel confident that they are buying a, a, a real or authentic NFT. I mean, there's nothing in theory stopping uh, um, artist James Cochran minting an NFT on Ethereum and, and putting it on the OpenSea 
uh, marketplace, which is the biggest marketplace for Ethereum NFTs, then also minting the same image on uh, Solana and putting it on Magic Eden, which is the um, uh, key Solana marketplace. You know, so you, you do have to have your wits about you, but there's lots of um, things that you can, can look at to try and determine whether or not um, a particular NFT is part of a collection um, and if that is from a verified artist. Can I just quickly add to that as well? Two things I carried on yesterday's pre-discussion and ended up, um, I'm really, apologies, Alex, to you. I did not mean to throw you off on what you were saying. And it was wrong for everyone for me to carry on our pre-discussion style discussion in a formal panel like today. So I apologize to everyone for that. But just also to add the point about that um, ownership and identity, it's important to think about the underlying database as well. So absolutely, there's this issue at the surface level of identity in terms of who you're talking about and how the digital identities work. But you are also storing it on a database and it's, it's stored somewhere. So you also need to trust that you get the continuity of that infrastructure actually continuing to happen. And right now, that's likely to be the case because it's still in its, you know, it's still ascending. People are still interested to kind of get more and more involved. But I mean, there will be some blockchains that are going to die out over time. And exactly what happens to all the records they have on them is, is a yet to be discovered situation. I'll just add to that, um, you know, there are different blockchains been around for different um, amounts of time. Um, for example, Bitcoin is a, a proof of work blockchain. I know uh, that's uh, lambasted for uh, using too much energy. I, I actually think the opposite. I don't think that's a problem. I don't think energy usage is a problem in itself. I actually think that um, proof of work blockchains can be a mechanism to um, uh, build innovation and uh, assist in sustainable outcomes. Um, and uh, they are less prone to centralization than proof of stake blockchains. Um, but um, uh, yeah, there's there's different levels of security. So if you have a dealing with a newer protocol, it's possibly going to be higher risk if the protocol doesn't have as high a market cap as, for example, Ethereum, then it might be less secure. You know, so there's a lot of factors to consider when you are, if you're an artist minting on a particular blockchain, if you are a, a purchaser looking to buy, you know, and, but David's point is a good one, just because... Um, you mint a NFT on Tezos doesn't mean that it's going to be there in four years. That if that, um, if that, uh, well, the blockchain will still be there, but um, whether it'll be worth anything might be a, a different issue. Thanks, James. Um, so I think we're just about out of time. So, uh, but I thought maybe we'll go around uh, the panelists and just give you 20 seconds to give us a takeaway and, uh, for the for the um, audience here, so um, start with you, Alex. Um, I was going to say a lot of lawyers here. Um, the uh, Law Society of England and Wales and their guidance for cryptocurrencies has said that every lawyer in England needs to understand cryptocurrency, smart contracts, and blockchain. So if they need to do that in England, we we all need to do it here. Thanks, Alex. Uh, David. My feeling is that technologists need to keep working on making this stuff just simpler and more intelligible. I think we've got a lot of work in terms of the communication of where we get to, and it's going to help everyone if we can actually agree on many aspects of this space. It's been fascinating to hear a whole bunch of topics I know very little about, but fully appreciate it crucial that sit on top of all of this sort of infrastructure that I'm looking at at the technical level. So it's going to stimulate a lot of further thought and reading for me, for sure. Uh, Benu? <clears throat> Uh, all I would say for anyone who wants to engage with NFTs, uh, just be just be super clear about why you're investing in them. Um, and and I, I always struggle with trying to value these things. Sometimes it doesn't matter whether there's a value or not. It's what you believe the value is. Uh, but like I said, if you're looking to make money, you want to want to fund someone who thinks it's more valuable than you think it is. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. Okay, um, James. I'll just say and don't be scared and give it a go. Because, um, but you know, as Beno says, you know, pick um, uh, pick your battles. You might want to start off small. You know, just uh, think about buying a uh, hundred dollars of Bitcoin. Understanding, educate yourself on what sort of wallet you need to use, what the process is, um, and, and it's the same with NFTs. Understand what sort of wallet you need, what's a, a marketplace. Do your research. 
educate yourself. But there's no need to be scared because once you've done one or two transactions, you'll see a lot of the process is quite similar to some of your existing centralized um, sort of platforms. Thanks, James. Um, just before uh, we go, I just want to do a little plug for um, Talents is hosting a, the New Zealand Conference on Law, Technology, Education, Practice and Policy on the 8th of September at AUT. Um, so uh, we're calling for abstracts at the moment. So if any of you would like to um, attend that, um, please um, check out the Talents uh, website. And just on behalf of Veracity Labs and Talents, I'd like to thank um, all our um, very active um, participants and sorry for those who I couldn't get to their questions, but um, this is a topic that's um, going to take a much longer than an hour to um, unpack. So, but thank you to, um, to, to James, Benu, uh, David and Alex. Kia ora. <laughs>